President, and I rise to join my colleague from Rhode Island and other colleagues this evening who are talking about the critical issue of climate change, uh, and especially uh, the facts around climate change, but also the fact that there are many who would deny the facts. This is a really important issue to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Climate change is not an abstraction. Climate change is not a next year or next decade issue. Climate change in Virginia is a today issue. Earlier today, I was in Norfolk, Virginia, which is in the Hampton Roads area near the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. Norfolk and the surrounding communities is the largest concentration of naval power in the world. It's the center of American naval operations. The headquarters of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet and it is already having to spend millions of dollars to elevate the piers where aircraft carriers come and go due to sea level rise. The Hampton Roads area is listed as the second most vulnerable community on the east coast of the United States to rising sea levels after New Orleans. This is a, a challenging issue in a lot of ways. I have friends who live in these communities who bought homes recently but now their homes aren't marketable. For most Americans, certainly for me, my home is the most valuable asset I own. And if you have that and then you suddenly can't sell it because climate is changing, sea level is rising, flooding is more recurrent, no one will buy your home. It's a very, very serious issue. In addition to the effect on individuals and businesses because of sea level rise, the effect on the naval station is significant. Current estimates are that rising sea levels in Norfolk will take the main road entrance into the center of American naval power and have that underwater by 2040, three hours a day, just because of normal tidal action. In times of storms, it would be worse. So imagine an America that counts on its Navy, that counts on that naval presence around the globe, having its largest naval base inaccessible because of sea level rise. Madam President, we have an interesting community. One of the most unique parts of Virginia is a small island, Tangier Island, that's in the center of the Chesapeake Bay. It's been continually inhabited since the 1600s as a community for watermen and women, the folks who, who, who you know, have traditionally made their living by going out and catching crabs and oysters and fish. And this is a small island of a few acres. It's one of the only places you can go in the United States where you can hear English spoken as Shakespeare would have spoken it, with a language that is an Elizabethan language. The community is very isolated in that way, and so you hear this beautiful English spoken there, and the community has many wonderful virtues to it, but the Chesapeake Bay is coming up around this community and eroding it. I received a letter from a middle school student within the last month, a handwritten letter that might have been the most heartfelt piece of communication I've received in uh, four plus years in the Senate saying, what are you doing about sea level rise? What can you do to help us deal with these issues so that Tangier as an island does not completely disappear? So for these reasons and many others in Virginia, we take this very, very seriously and we have to deal with it. And I'll tell you something else about Virginians. Virginians believe in science. The, uh, the Virginia political figure we most admire was the preeminent scientist of his day, Thomas Jefferson. He was a scientist. And Virginians overwhelmingly believe in science. 70% of Virginians accept the scientific consensus that human activity is causing climate change and that it is urgent that we do something about it. 70% of Virginians believe in that proposition. But I'm here today because my friend from Rhode Island asked me to come and talk about the fact that there is an organized effort, not just to battle about the policy about climate science, but to knowingly try to misrepresent the status of climate science and suggest that climate change is not occurring. They're denying that it exists. They're denying that it's a concern. They're working against any reasonable solutions. Now, of course, we've got to be open to points of view and reasonable differences of opinion and have a debate. But when the science things and people are in an organized way who know better are trying to fight against it, we should be suspicious. So a group of senators are speaking today and tomorrow to discuss these organizations that constitute what my friend from Rhode Island has termed a web of denial, an organized effort to deny science. And so let me just talk a little bit because a number of these deniers 
are companies that at least have P.O. boxes or nonprofit organizations that at least have P.O. boxes in Virginia. Um, the same Virginia where Tangier Island is disappearing, the same Virginia where the Navy is having to spend to shore up their infrastructure also has some shadowy organizations that are trying to deny the real science involved. There's, there's an organization called the Science and Public Policy Institute, and it purports to summarize available academic literature. Here's a quote. Quote, they further note that decadal variability in sea level is observed, but to date there is no detectable secular increase in the rate of sea level rise over the period 1950 to 2000. They also report that no increase in the rate of sea level rise has been detected for the entire 20th century, close quote. Now, this is a group that they throw in a few sciency words like decadal variability, but the, what they're really saying is there's no sea level rise. This is at odds with the conclusions of virtually every scientist who has studied this issue, including scientists at Virginia Universities, Old Dominion University, the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences at William and Mary. Those scientists says that sea level rise has risen a foot since industrialization, and the range of future sea level rise on the Virginia coast is anywhere from one and a half additional feet to seven feet by the year 2100. Now, they will acknowledge some question about is it going to be a foot and a half, is it going to be seven feet, but they don't challenge the basic science surrounding sea level rise. So which is it, one and a half to seven feet, or you don't need to worry about it, don't worry, be happy. Without getting a PhD in atmospheric science and building your own quantitative models, how do you know who's right? Well, here's a clue. Look at who funds these organizations. In the case of ODU and William and Mary, the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences, which is one of the most preeminent marine sciences organizations in the nations with Scripps in San Diego and Woods Hole in Massachusetts, it's not hard. Hard. They're state universities. They're funded by the General Assembly of Virginia, which is two Republican houses. Um, and they are reaching a scientific conclusion that says climate change is serious. But with the Science and Policy Institute, it's a bit nebulous, and it's kind of hard to figure out. But there's online sources that enable you to track how organizations are funded through foundations with ties, frankly, to the energy industry. According to those, one of these sources, it's called the Smog Blog, one of this institute's, the Science and Public Policy Institute's major funders is called the Donors Capital Fund, which has distributed $170 million to various conservative causes and describes itself as being, quote, dedicated to the ideals of limited government, personal responsibility, and free enterprise, close quote. A New York Times article from as far back as 2003 de documents a connection between this foundation and an organization that also has a point of view, ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is a funder, or in the past has been a funder of this organization. Now, why, don't, why does an ExxonMobil or conservative organization just publish the material on their own websites under the, their own bylines? Well, my guess is that they have scientists who actually know the science. And there's been recent information about ExxonMobil. They understand the climate science. They couldn't publish this under their own byline and meet their own standards of truthfulness, but they are providing funding to an organization that is denying climate change. In other words, the organization is just a delivery vehicle for information that is meant to be seen as impartial scientific information, but is in fact not impartial at all. So when you see one group saying that there's been no sea level rise, and another saying there's been a lot and we could be in for more, and if you're wondering who to believe, take a look at who's funding the research. Here's another organization, the Virginia Institute for Public Policy. Quote, here's a quote from them, regulations prescribing a reduction or even a complete cessation of Virginia's CO2 emissions will have, will have absolutely no effect on global climate. If there's Virginia regulations that even eliminate Virginia CO2, it will have no effect on global, on global climate. Now, here's, that's an interesting quote, because it's not technically a lie, because it's literally true. Virginia's share of world CO2 emissions is infinitesimal. It all, it wouldn't affect the entire globe in a measurable way. But that's like saying, one vote, your vote's not going to make the difference. Or, one cigarette won't hurt you, so go ahead and have one. This argument is a kind of a classic hide-the-ball argument that makes a statement that's technically true, 
that it essentially is promoting a false point of view that, oh, well, we shouldn't do anything about it. 